Okay, we're going to do a very uh, simple-minded uh, version of spectroscopy, uh, motivated by the Deruca, Georgia, and Glashow uh, approach. Uh, also, several Russian groups, uh, I believe not Sakharov, in fact, uh, had similar ideas. But uh, quark masses and uh, the elementary uh, Quark masses, uh, hyperfine splitting, and uh, binding of uh, heavy quarks, a set, separate uh, uh, separate uh, yeah separate term for a binding of uh, heavy quarks with one another, are what we're going to be using. And uh, this is uh, in the same spirit as uh, semi-empirical mass formulae for uh, isotopes. So uh, motivated by uh, QCD theory, but really uh, just uh, semi-empirical mass formulae using uh, as much uh, as possible from actual experimental data and uh, theoretical input where, where absolutely needed. So you have to tell me when to turn the page, John. Yes, not yet. If you do this, you find that you have to use different quark masses for mesons and for baryons. And uh, this is uh, related to the flux tube model. Gail Mann and Zweig uh, originally proposed any combination of quarks and antiquarks giving uh, integral charge. So uh, with a, a Z3, uh, symmetry. Uh, and mesons such as uh, tetraquarks and pentaquarks would also have integral charges. And the question is, why weren't these exotic particles seen? And they now have been seen, and particularly involving states involving heavy quarks, charm and, and uh, bottom. So we're going to discuss uh, two meson molecules, pentaquarks, CCU and CCD baryons, lifetimes, stable, two quark, two heavy quark, uh, two light uh, anti quark, uh, tetra quarks, and uh, if we have time, also the uh, J psi, the pair of J psi resonances. So I want to thank Marek Karliner for many enjoyable collaborations and our NC, our LHCB colleagues for many fruitful discussions. Okay, now we turn the page. So this is a set of predictions for mesons and baryons with different masses for the quarks in mesons from uh, their, their masses uh, in baryons. And the difference in mass of the quarks is a unified 55 MeV. So uh, if you scan down these uh, relations, there are hyperfine interactions which scale as inverse quark masses, and there are constituent quark masses themselves, and uh, SU3 is broken by having different mass for the strange quark and for the up and down quarks, and we are working in the isospin with symmetric limit. Next. So if, if one wants to use uh, the same masses for quarks in mesons and baryons, one adds a term which turns out to be 165 MeV, which is three times 55 MeV. And this is what I mean by the uh, empirical mass formula. Uh, very, very simple for a number of light quark uh, hadrons. Notice that we have uh, the light quark octet mesons and the light quark octet and decimate baryons. Next slide, please. One can also, if one gets uh, estimates of the charm quark mass, one can also uh, describe baryons with one charm quark, again, with uh, not too many additional parameters. Uh, next slide, please. 
and baryons with one V quark. Again, with, all of these descriptions are within uh, several MeV of one another of, of the experimental value. So uh, there are some simple relations. Look at the bottom one, for instance, the hyperfine splitting in the in the uh, B sub S and the hyperfine splitting in the D sub S are uh, expected to be uh, related to one another. Next slide, please. So here's a comparison of the parameters. The uh, light quarks up and down are 308.6 MeV in a meson, 363.7 in a baryon, and a difference of about 55 MeV. Down the line, there's a difference of about 55 MeV. If you take different quark masses in uh, a meson and a baryon, or if you have a unified uh, quark mass, the difference of the mass is ascribable to the uh, string uh, uh, string junction. So one string junction is worth 165 MeV. So the question then is to predict the mass of object with two or more string junctions. For instance, the tetraquark meson has two junctions. The pentaquark baryon has three junctions. The dibaryon has four junctions and so forth. So one is looking for tests of these. Uh, it's complicated by the fact that many of the higher quark number uh, states are very near a threshold for uh, molecules. And uh, nonetheless, there are a couple of cases where one can actually test the uh, addition of uh, uh, two string junctions. Next slide, please. Evidence for uh, heavy quark, anti quark, light quark, anti quark states, such as the X3872, had been accumulated since the early 2000s. But uh, the question was can we predict the mass of a simpler state, which is heavy quark, heavy quark, light quark? So, a, for instance, a two charm quark baryon. And we were motivated partly by the claim by the ferret, the Celex experiment at Fermilab, that the state at 3520 was a candidate for a CCU state. And they also <laughs> claimed a state at 3460 as a CCD state. That would be an enormous uh, isospin splitting. Nobody got that in any of their models. So, uh, in order for it to be uh, it's expected to be real, one would have to invent new physics. But it hasn't been confirmed by anybody else. Anyway, we estimated the mass using the the Rukla George I. Glashow idea needed uh, to estimate the mass of the CC di quark. And I'll mention that in a minute, how we uh, estimated that, but uh, we predicted a mass of 3627 plus or minus 12 MeV, and that's to be compared with the LHCb value of 3621.4 plus or minus 0 0.78 MeV. Now, there were many other predictions in the literature, but they spanned a wide range of at least uh, 100 MeV. And, uh, we were rather pleased uh, to see uh, the agreement uh, after uh, three years after we predicted it. Next slide, please. I think I'll skip the detail of the uh, uh, spectra that was seen both in Lambda K Pi Pi and in Psi C Pi Plus uh, and uh, consistent mass. Next slide, please. You are at 10 minutes now, John. Okay. Uh, let's uh, skip this, uh, just the tail to the inputs. But uh, next slide, please. 
a crucial ingredient of the estimate was that the quark pair has to be regarded as more deeply bound when neither member of the pair is a U or a D. In particular, uh, the CS bar binding was estimated to be minus 70 MeV. And we assumed that the binding energy of the CS pair divided by the binding energy of the CS bar pair was a half as it is for a single gluon exchange. And this is simply an ansatz at this point. So uh, we also uh, did the same for CS, did the same for BS, minus 42 MeV for BS. That was a scaling uh, from minus 83 MeV for uh, BS bar. So once we uh, estimated the extra binding for a heavy quark pair, such as C, C, B, and BB, then we're ready to deal with those in, let's say, a CCU state. And uh, in particular, the binding energy for CC was estimated to be minus 129 MeV. And that was a crucial ingredient in our prediction of the CCU uh, mass. Next slide, please. But the question arose, where are the exotics? And this is going back in history and Giancarlo very nicely stated the uh, uh, origin of uh, this question. Uh, no two quark, two anti-quark mesons had been seen composed of just UDNS. Uh, so one expects resonances in pi plus pi minus and K plus pi minus but not in pi plus pi plus or k plus pi plus. And similarly, no pentaquark baryons were seen made of just these three quarks, the U, D, and S. And there have been some false alarms. Uh, Giancarlo mentioned some uh, for baryonium. And there was also a, a state called the theta reported to decay to K plus neutron and K zero proton, but it was not confirmed by other experiments. And my personal opinion is that it was an artifact of the production process. Now the situation changed with the introduction of heavy quarks. And the reason that the heavy quarks allow the exotics to be displayed is that the heavy quarks have a lower kinetic energy, well, non-relativistically, P squared over 2M. M gets large, the kinetic energy gets small. And this helped to stabilize the ground states containing such uh, heavy core. So in particular, the charm, anti-charm, U, U bar state is very close to D0, D0 bar star special. Next slide, please. Now here's a little bit of expansion on the uh, reasoning that uh, Giancarlo mentioned. This was in uh, 1968. Uh, this was just at the time when duality was emerging and uh, I have to tell a story about uh, the Veneziano formula. The uh, Veneziano formula was hammered out piecemeal by Virasoro, Rubinstein, and Veneziano at the Weizmann Institute. But the last final touches were put on it once Gabriel got on a boat from Israel to uh, Europe, to uh, Italy, in a quiet environment. And yeah. If I can say a word, yes, I remember those times because after that, Gabriele 
came to CERN where, where I was also having some, uh, uh, spending some time. And so, uh, okay. What you said is perfectly true. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, here are diagrams that uh, I invented to display the uh, duality between meson-meson scattering in the S channel dual to meson-meson scattering in the P channel or meson-baryon scattering in the S channel due to T channel non-exotic meson exchange. But when we came to baryon, anti-baryon scattering in the S channel, it was two quarks and two antiquarks that was due to one quark antiquark pair in the T channel. No getting around it. There had to be, if duality was correct, there had to be baryonium states, uh, the S channel of the right hand diagram. Now, resonances form, in fact, by annihilation of a quark and an anti quark. You can do the following exercise with your particle data group list of particles. Take any meson and any other meson such that a quark and one meson can annihilate an anti-quark and another meson. And for P star, the center of mass three momentum, less than about 350 MeV over C, they will always form a resonance. The meson baryon systems in which such an annihilation can occur can also form a resonance with P star less than 250 MeV over C. And so if one takes an optical point of view and talks about an effective size, which is a little bit larger for baryon antibaryon annihilation, baryon antibaryon should form a resonance below P star of about 200 MeV over C. As far as we know, this is true. These resonances for light quarks, however, often turn out to be so broad that uh, they don't display themselves. And that's the situation that changed when uh, heavy quarks were introduced uh, into these uh, states. Next slide, please. I think I'll skip this one. And here is a couple of the signatures from CDF and from D0 of the X3872. Next slide, please. Now let's skip this uh, details and properties. And here's another picture of the 1S, 2S, and 3S pi peaks just at B, B star, or B star, B star threshold. Again, it looks very much like a molecular picture uh, is holding for these states. Next slide, please. Again, pentaquarks. As of now, there are three narrow J psi photon resonances at 4312, 4440, and 4457 MeV. Also, all narrow and all near appropriate thresholds. Now one pion exchange can't bind sigma C D bar star because a pion can't couple to D D. But uh, if you have two pion exchange with an intermediate lambda C D star uh, intermediate say that, that that works okay. So one pion and two pion exchange seem to be needed to bind these pentacles. Okay, next slide, uh, we'll skip. Oh no, we'll keep this. This is, you can see a horizontal band, a faint horizontal band, that's uh, a combination of the two uh, higher uh, P sub C states. And, uh, you saw the projection in Bangkok's uh, in Thomas's uh, dollars pot. Next You're slide. at 20 minutes, John. Okay, thank you. 
next uh, next slide. I think that's the piece of C. But that was seen as well uh, at 4459 MeV. Can you speak a little louder, please? At 19 MeV below size C0, T0 star threshold. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. So, um, no, back, back up one. So I'm not going to have a chance to discuss all of these uh, in detail, but uh, Marek and I have had a lot of fun with the LHCB data. First of all, um, we back in 2007 or 8, we predicted the mass of the Xi C, Xi B, and the Omega B, and uh, before each one of these was found using the heavy quartz symmetry that uh, I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, the doubly charmed baryon mass I've mentioned already. Pentacork masses uh, are correlated with uh, uh, thresholds. Next slide, please. Tetraquark masses, I'll go into these in a little more detail. And uh, there was an exotic hadron with open heavy flavor a C, D bar, S, U bar uh, final state where we uh, anticipated the mass uh, within several MeV. And spectra, structure in the J psi, J psi spectrum. Again, uh, those last two were published in PhysWeb uh, in 2020. Next slide, please. Let's skip this uh, lifetimes. And prediction for omega CC, CC, CCS should be visible. This uh, is a comparison of the predictions of the two. Um, yeah, 3802 MEV predicted for the CCS. And uh, I don't know what the situation is with respect to that state. Uh, right, CB. Maybe Thomas can uh, comment. Um, all right, next slide, please. Okay, the tetraquark. So we found this TC U bar, D bar unbound. It could decay to D, D star or D, D gamma. The lowest lying BC U bar D bar state was near the BD gamma threshold. So we could not tell for sure whether it was bound or unbound. And we predicted the binding energy of the BB U bar D bar state to be 215 MeV below B, B star threshold and 170 MeV below B, B zero gamma threshold. So even though this was at the high end of the binding energies that uh, various groups predicted, there's no way that it's going to be unbound. So if one can produce the state, one should see a, a stable BB, U bar, D bar state. But the production is, we've estimated the production is going to take some time. Now here we've regarded the BB as a colored three star dichlor. So the argument that uh, Tom, that uh, Marek made uh, holds in this case, one does not have a flux tube connecting them. They're, they're just a single, they form a single entity because they are, the expectation value of them, of their relative coordinate is very small. Uh, what else? So the mass prediction then relied on accounting for the constituent quark masses, the hyperfine interactions, and the binding effects. And the binding effects, we had to estimate what the binding of dB was compared with what we knew the estimate of dB bar was uh, binding. Next slide, please. So uh, again, here are the pictures for the flux tubes for a, 
ordinary meson, no string junction, an ordinary baryon, baryon one string junction, and an exotic tetrapore, two string junctions. So the question is what qualifies as a two junction state? Mm -hmm. there, there's a peak in the D plus K minus channel, that's C D bar S U bar. So that's an example of C, a, a genuine two junction state. But uh, the state with two heavy quarks and two light quarks, in that state, the Q, Q prime, heavy Q, Q prime state qualifies as an anti dichroic state, again, by the arguments that, uh, that Marek made. And let's go to the next slide. Now, if the prediction of the C, C, U bar, D bar quark is correct. And we notice that it's 3882 MeV compared with the experimental value of 3875 MeV. If that is correct, then uh, let's uh, see the next slide. The strange partner of that state should be at 4106 MeV. So that's a, a that uh, that would be a signal in the D star D sub S and D D sub R D sub S star final state. So we. Uh, advocate study of those final states as well as D0, D0, K plus. Now, if that fails, the likely explanation is that the state at 3875 MeV is indeed uh, a kinematic effect or uh, a molecule. But uh, we'll see uh, if the strange partner is observe where we think it is uh, for a uh, genuine compact tetraquark. Next slide, please. I think I'll skip this one. This is the evidence for the C, S, C bar, S bar, U, D state. But that would be a, okay. And this is the spectrum for the day, the dual J psi, uh, resonance and we we regard the sharp behavior the sharp uh, increase around 3700 around 70 sorry 6700 and 7200 as the emergence of the threshold for instance for the lower one to chi c0 states and for the upper one maybe a, a pair of, of Xi C. Next slide. So to sum up, exotic mesons and baryons beyond QQ bar and QQ cube do exist and molecular configurations are at least part of the story. I had predicted baryonium states in 1968 and in 1972, my colleague to be, uh, Peter Freund and I had a bet. Peter Freund felt that exotics were just around the corner. And uh, I said, I don't think it's going to happen so soon. He bet that they would be seen by 1972. And uh, I bet that there was no way that uh, that could happen so soon. And we bet, uh, a dinner at Le Francais, uh, the uh, French restaurant in Wheeling. Um, I won, so he bought the dinner, but uh, I, I, I bought the wine. And uh, I wish Peter were around to see now 
that in fact the, the products have been seen. Heavy cores have a lower kinetic energy and they help to stabilize the exotic configurations containing them. And remember this bet was made before even the charm and quark was seen. So techniques for mass estimation, similar mind, simple-minded techniques seem to work pretty well uh, as uh, proposed, for instance, by uh, the roof of Georgia and Bashaw. And the only additional ingredient is the extra binding energy associated with heavy quarks. We still don't know if there are Many CC, C bar, C bar states lighter than 2M of the lightest C, C bar state, or D, D, D bar, B bar lighter than 2M of the uh, A to some B state. And we don't know what physics governs structures in the J psi, psi, J psi spectrum. All we said in that paper was in addition to the uh, uh, emergent the thresholds, it looked like the state around 3700 was uh, not the 1s, but the 2s state of uh, J psi, J psi. So multi-quark ex exotics are a great testing ground for the flux, to flux tube con concept. And we still are looking for further evidence that a state is composed of one spring function. <laughs> So that's it. Thanks very much, John. And now we can move into, into discussion. So please raise your hand if you have questions or comments. Kobe, please. Yes, I have a question. I mean, in this math formula that you presented, you didn't to take into account the contribution of the strings of the flux tube. I, I doubt very much with it, whether with such a formula you can explain the masses of the excited states with the non-trivial angular momentum. The, I think that one has to take into account also the contribution to the mass from the flux tube itself. We haven't done very much with P states. Uh, with, with orbital excitation is true, yes. Uh, that, that's, that's a limitation of our current uh, approach. Yeah, well, when, if you are referring to states with high angular momentum, then it's well, certainly- Well, it can be both, both high angular momentum or high excited state with the same angular momentum. In short, I mean, I don't think that you see the radio trajectory structure in this mass formula. Absolutely correct, Kobe. And the reason is that in our formulation, whatever contribution the flux tube makes to the rest mass of the baryon is already incorporated in the constituent masses of the quarks. Well, this can, if you, if this you take can, this can, just one second, this can only work for the ground state. Once you start to consider highly excited states, either radial or angular momentum, then of course you need to take into account the significant contribution you're going to have from the flux tube. Mm -hmm. So we agree. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I have one comment that uh, it was stressed uh, in passing, but the universality of Reggie slopes uh, is a consequence of the flux tube picture. Namely, you, know, you have a Y for a baryon, you have a Y with one of the three flux tubes extended and the old Nambu rotating string picture uh, applies to that, but only one of the flux tubes is being extended in the rotation of the state. That's thank you, John. And Igor, please. Uh, yeah, thank you for the interesting talk. 
Yeah. Could you say again why this, uh, say, C, C, U bar, D bar, you don't count it as having two string junctions, but only one? Is that somehow because the, the two heavy quarks are on top of each other, or why do you not count an extra string junction there? That's, that's exactly the point. That the, when it's two Cs, we assume that the states are close enough to one another that together they form a single three star in the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to have a string junction, you need lighter dike works kind of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the, the point is that the potential between heavy quarks has a linear piece, which is the usual confining thing, and the Coulomb part. And the heavier the quark, the more dominant the Coulomb part is, they get very close to each other. For example, two big quarks are less than one fifth of a Fermi on the average from each other. And such distances, you know, one fifth of a Fermi is one inverse GeV. So at once inverse GeV, you don't really see much of a flux tube. Maybe there is some residuals. I mean, we, we talked about it yesterday uh, when discussing lattice measurements, right? I mean, when you try to extract the, the, the confining potential from lattice measurements, you have to get rid of the Coulomb part. So basically what happens for very heavy quarks, they sit almost on top of each other and the flux tube has no, literally no space to develop. But I think, Mara, that even for a light die quark, die quark of light quark, there is no string between them. They, there is only one junction and one string. That's what we read from the trajectory. Had there been two strings, then the form of the trajectory would have been different. So the picture that there is a die quark and a one single string is correct. I think whether the dike quark is of light quarks or of heavy quarks. No, but when you talk about when you talk about rigid trajectories of baryons, then there is one junction in the first place. In any case, I mean the only place where you can really distinguish between various dynamical schemes is these multi-quark states. A baryon has one junction, end of story. I mean, we all know this, right? And the question is how many strings it has. And I think that the picture is that it has a single string. Oh yeah, sure. We all agree about that, but there is one junction and a single, or a very short string between the two light quarks. It, does, it doesn't show up in the regia trajectory. Exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. We, yeah. we agree. Uh, okay. But do but we in, have. But in case of sick walk, I would say that the size is not that small. Uh, so, so sick walk are not that heavy. Uh, I mean. When you talk about two sick walks. Yeah, uh, no, say, for example, uh, J psi size or whatever, uh, I mean, it's kind of in the range of uh, linear potential rather than Coul Coulomb. Absolutely. So it's probably, it might be, this might be the reason why the TCC that was recently yeah. seen is just at the threshold of DD star. And the situation will be dramatically different for for BB tetraquark. So, indeed, this is quite exciting. I think that one can learn just from spectroscopy something non-trivial about the flux tube structure in a hadron. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. If if not, I. Uh, I just want to make one stressing one thing John showed very briefly, but I think it's important. We have seen that experimentally the CC U bar D bar tetra quark is just at the threshold of DD star meson. 
it is very likely that the BC U bar D bar tetra quark is somewhat below the threshold, which means it can will be only able to decay weakly. And so it will be the first example of a genuinely stable hadron, multi multi quarks hadron which is stable under strong interactions. Now LHCB has observed a lot of B sub C mesons, and I think this is an encouraging sign that they should be able to observe the corresponding B C U bar D bar tetra quark. Okay, so it's time for us to move on. Thank you very much, John, again for the very nice talk.